All right. Well, we'll begin with prayer requests. Any prayer requests this evening? Get my notebook here. <laughs> well, the people in my work are getting sick. Mm -hmm. I still haven't gotten what I need. No social security. Okay, we'll keep that in prayer. Just keep you wait for a while. <laughs> Anything else? No? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for the opportunity we have to come and to study your word. We pray, Lord, that you would um, just uh, be with us and watch over us, Lord. You know our problems. You know our needs. Even if we don't know them ourselves. And we pray that you would come and and minister to each one of us in only a way that you know how. We pray, Father, for Autumn's work and all the people there that are getting sick. And uh, we pray for your healing hand to be there. We pray for Dawn and this issue with Social Security, Lord. You know the situation there. And uh, we just pray that you would just, um, just uh, stand in the gap for her and help her in that situation. Father, we thank you for this time that we have. We pray that you would open up our eyes and our ears, that we may um, see and hear the message you have for us and help us to apply these things to our hearts. We ask these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, I am still undecisive of what I want to do. Have you ever had that? Flip a coin. Flip a coin. Well, I need about several coins to... To flip, yeah, paper, rock, scissors. Um, uh, well, yeah, we'll do. We'll. Uh, I know, right? I think we're going to do that. Um, let's go to Acts 24. I hope. Acts 24. Uh, well, we're going to start at verse 1. We're going to... Uh, work our way through it the reason why it's acts 24 is we've been going i've been going through this with dr mcgee on my daily bible reading and he came across something that i thought was interesting and so i think i'll share it with you guys and i want to talk about the concept of um when it comes to sharing the gospel how do we go about sharing the gospel to someone, right? We talk about different ways in which we share the gospel, right? Uh, we have Paul, who is uh, very good at sharing the gospel. And he has a conversation with a man by the name of Felix. And uh, he talks about three things that is very important that we need to talk about to talk about um, sharing the gospel. But I, I do want to have a little bit of uh, uh, how, how I, I should say, how do people present the gospel today? What are different methods that people use to share the gospel? Blast. They blast them, right? They'll get a whole bunch of verses that talk about all the bad things and right, turn or burn and 
and uh, you know, go to hell and all this stuff and come to Jesus moment, right? And uh, one sided. So either God is nothing but love, yeah, uh -huh. or nothing but burn and yeah. 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 The fire escape. Yeah. Uh, you know, this whole thing, and then if you don't get right with God, if you don't become a Christian, you're going to go to hell. And he says, So, are you a Christian? I, I said, Well, yeah. He disappeared real quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, and then that's the sad thing is that once you get saved, um, are you being nurtured? You know, are you being, you know, um, Yep. Yeah. And and that's important. So, but I do want to look at this this chapter a little bit here. Um, Paul is um, gets arrested, <laughs> and he goes to um, F uh, Felix, who is a very corrupt worldly governor i mean he is he is a corrupt man and he is a worldly man but he knows something about jesus and so he comes and and he hears about paul and what i want to look at here is i don't want to look at all the whole thing but i just want to look at starting at verse uh, 24 it says but some days later felix arrived with Drusilla, his wife, who was a Jewess, and sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. But as he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix became frightened and said, Go away for the present, and when I find time, I will summon you. At the same time, too, he was hoping that Paul would give him... Uh, that money would be given him by Paul. Therefore, he also used to send for him quite often and converse with him. But after two years he had passed, Felix was succeeded by Pontius Festus, and wishing to do a Jews a favor, uh, Felix left Paul in prison. Now, what I want to focus on uh, here is the three things that Paul talked to, Fe to Felix about. First of all, he talked to them about righteousness. Now, what does that mean? Well, he talked to them about how righteous God is and how unrighteous we are. And that's a very important thing, right? Um, we know that the Bible tells us that God is, is a holy God. In, uh, in uh, Isaiah chapter 6, I think I talked about this on Sunday, that... Uh, of all the things that the seraphim who were flying around could have said, uh, they called him holy, 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 right? And the same thing in, in Revelation chapter 4. When they were flying around again, they were crying out, holy, holy, holy. And um, because God is holy. And one of the things that we find out real quickly in, in life is that we are not holy. And that we need or want in some way, shape, or form to be holy, right? If you remember Isaiah, if you'll turn over there for a moment, that when he was uh, in the presence of these, in the presence of God, let's see here, in Isaiah 6, It says that, uh, um, it says, In the year that of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. 
And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out with the temple uh, while the temple was filling with smoke. Now watch this. What did, he, what did Isaiah say? Isaiah learned really quickly that when you're in the presence of a holy God, you find out real quick how unholy you are. Right? And it says, then I said, verse, verse 5, Woe is me, for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King of the Lord of hosts. So the very first thing that we, when we want to share the gospel with somebody, is we share with them the fact that God is holy, or God is righteous, and we are unrighteous. See, the, the, the thing that, that, that I point out to people is that a lot of times people don't realize that they need a Savior. Right? If I ask you, if you died tonight, how do you know that you would be led into God's heaven? Well, a lot of times this is what people will say. I'm a good person, right? I do good works. Well, this is what they I do more good things than I do bad things, right? And what we find is that we, we don't do good things. In fact, we do bad things. And, and, and even God says that all of our righteousness in Isaiah is as filthy rags. Now those filthy rags mean um, menstrual blood rags used for women on their time of the month. That's what it means. He says that's what our, that's what our righteousness is in God's sight. We can't do anything in our own power and strength to be right before God. It's not anything that we do that gets us saved, but it's what Christ did on the cross. And by raising, coming to raise to life the third day, that's what saves us. And so he was speaking about righteousness. And then he spoke about self-control. The fact that uh, we, uh, when we're saved, that God helps us to, to get rid of things in our lives that aren't necessarily bad, but aren't necessarily helpful for us in our Christian walk. You know, um, whatever that might be. Uh, things that uh, just, you know, that we once did that were probably not very good. Um, you know, in, in our denomination, we're, they're really big about smoking and drinking and all that fun stuff. And I, I've, I've shared this story, I think, um, about uh, Walter, the guy that was a big cowboy that got saved uh, at our church, and he, wa he chewed tobacco. And um, he was an older gentleman, and I taught a senior adult Sunday school class. And he would come in, and he would bring his spitting can with him. And he would set that spit, and he'd sit in the front row of my Sunday school class. And he would be spitting away on, the, on, on that. And I would have some of those ladies that had been there for a long time, they'd come up to me after Sunday school, and they'd say, Pastor Mason, you need to go over there and tell him to quit chewing tobacco. And I says, no, ma'am, I will not. Well, why not? I says, because... When the Holy Spirit's ready to tell him to quit chewing tobacco, he'll tell him. That's not my, that's not my place. So, a couple months later, uh, we, one day I didn't see him with his chewing tobacco, and like that for about a month, and I came up to him, I says, hey, you, you know, where's your chewing tobacco? Yeah, you know, the more that I got to share in Jesus with people, they kind of looked at me, like, you need to get rid of your chewing tobacco if you really believe Christ has saved you from your sins. And so the Holy Spirit told me that it was probably time for me to give that up. So I, I gave it up. So, uh, But we talk about self-control, you know, and the fact that, again, that stuff is not done because of me, but it's the Holy Spirit that helps us give those things up. Right? And so self-control. 
you know, that doesn't mean that we're going to have less fun. That doesn't mean that we're going to be sticks in the mud. But what God does is he shows us other things that are even better than those things in the first place that we once thought were fun and good. Then he talked about, lastly, the judgment to come, right? He spoke about uh, righteousness. He spoke about judgment. And he talked about judgment to come. Now, one of the things that we always know is that Jesus is going to come back again, right? And I grew up in, in the 90s, and I grew up with uh, my grandma and grandpa. My, well, my grandma on my mom's side was very Pentecostal. I mean, <laughs> she was, I love her today. I mean, I do. I love her, love her, love her. And, um, and, but she was very, very, she loved end time stuff. I mean, she liked Jack Van Ippy. Uh, she liked this guy, his name was Hilton Sutton. And I remember Hilton Sutton would do these prophecy conferences. And one time they came to Kearney. And my, my grandma wanted me to go. So I, you know, I said, okay, I'm in high school. And I go, I get a syllabus that's about thicker than my Bible. Like, not really, but it looked about as thick as my Bible. And the outline is, is, is bigger than the book of Revelation itself on this thing. And he goes and he tries to explain to us uh, the message of Revelation and all this stuff. And I get done with that thing, and I'm more confused than I, <laughs> than I was when I went in there. And I remember that as I was growing up, you know, and I knew that God had called me to be a pastor, I would say, well, Lord, how do you want me to approach this subject of the end times? Because if we're not careful, we can get lost in that. This is what the Lord told me. He didn't speak to me in an audible voice or anything, but, uh, but he, he just made it clear of two things. Number one, Jesus is coming back. I'm coming back, right? And number two, are you ready for me when I come back? You know, we don't know when he's going to come back. He could come back today, tomorrow, next week. We don't know. But the fact is, are you ready for my return when I do come back? You know, and, and here's here's what it's saying. If you look over with me um, to the book of Revelation, chapter 20, because when Jesus comes back, he's going to bring judgment. Now, we don't like to talk about judgment. We don't like to talk about hell. We don't like to talk about these things, but they're real things, real concepts. And I talk about them because I don't want you to go there. I don't want you to go there. They're awful places. It's not fun. You know, we read about hell, and, and uh, I used to remember my grandma, again, she liked uh, uh, that kind of stuff, and uh, she liked the TBN, and they had, at the time, in the early 90s, a video called To Hell and Back, and this was like six people that's gone to, or supposedly died and went to hell, and uh, basically you go and you watch this 60-minute video, and you're about scared out of your mind. <laughs> And you better go to the altar because, you know. But uh, um, but I say that because not to scare people, but it is to scare you. You don't want to go there. It's not a place you want to go. But we don't do that because we, we're mad at you. We do it because we love you, right? If I wouldn't w love the people here, I would not be doing this, right? But I, I love what I do, and I want everybody to be saved and I want everybody to be nourished in the word of God so that's why I'm here but if you look at Revelation chapter 20 this is what's going to happen when Jesus comes back look at verse number uh, 11 might happen if I okay. then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it from whose presence earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them and I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which are written in the book, according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and Hades gave up uh, the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Now, I'm going to stop there. Didn't you just tell me, Pastor Mason, 
that you cannot be saved by your own deeds. Now, why are you being judged by your deeds, right? Here's, here's the deal, okay? There's only one right answer to this question. Okay? Verse 14. Then the death of Hades was thrown into the lake of fire. That is the second death. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown in the lake of fire. Notice that it doesn't say whose, whose person had more good deeds than bad deeds. Here's the deal. If you don't trust Christ as your Savior, God will judge you according to your deeds. But if you trust Christ as your Savior, He puts your name in the book of life. What does that book of life mean? It means that you've been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus. God can't touch you. Satan can't touch you then. You, you are no longer judged by your works. Because what that says is that all your deeds that you've done, Christ fulfills it. Christ covers it. Your name is written in blood, in Christ's blood, in the book of life. So the question that he says there is, is your name written in the book of life? And so what happens? Well, this is what he says. Three things, right, that he said there. Spoke on righteousness. He spoke on judgment and self-control. Now, how, what did Felix do? How did he respond to this? Well, he responded with conviction, right? But as he was discussing these things, right, it says, Felix became frightened and said, Go away for the present time, and when I find time, I will summon you. Now, hold on just a second. Hold that thought. Because... I want to read it from another translation. Because another translation will help us. It says, in, and I'm reading the New King James here. It says, now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid. And he answered, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Now here's my response to that. There will never be a convenient time to accept Christ as your Savior. <laughs> the more you put off making Christ your Savior, the easier it'll be for you to say no. Felix never accepted Jesus as his Savior. Why? Because he was looking for a convenient time. And you're never going to find a convenient time. Right? Earlier in the book of Acts, Paul says, today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, not yesterday, today. Okay, now is the time. And we, we look at that here. So as we're sharing the message of Jesus, and someone says, well, I'll do it when it's convenient for me. Well, you don't know where you're going to be. You don't know what's going to happen to you, right? It is easier for that to happen. Dr. McGee tells a story of um, a pastor in a big church in Dallas, Texas. And when he went there, uh, th this other pastor, there was a lawyer that was there. And um, several years later, this lawyer never came to Christ. And he told this pastor, he says, you know, when I first started coming to your church, some of your sermons just kept me up at night. I was really convicted by it. But you know what? The more I slept, the easier it was to listen to your sermons. And now they don't bother me no more. Now we laugh at that, but that's sad. 
because it means that your heart is hard. Someone asked me they, uh, one time, they says, Pastor, is there ever a place where God will stop calling you to be your, your, his, your Savior? And I says, no, God will never stop calling you, but your heart and your ears can become so hard and filled with wax that you stop hearing the message in your heart. My friends, don't ever be that. Don't ever get that way. Be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And as we saw in this chapter, that uh, that he never was... Um, I mean, the sky never came to Christ, right? He was afraid. Go away for now when I... Uh, have a convenient time, I will call for you. And meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he goes back to his old ways, right? He's, he's a worldly person. He wants the money. So therefore, he would send for him more often and converse with him. And I guarantee you that Paul would speak on these things every time. And he would get easier and easier to listen to. Why? Because his heart became more and more hardened. But after two years, Porcius Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. So we even see that at that point, he keeps him there. But why do I share this? Well, I share this because it's kind of been on my heart that as we, you know, I know that there's a lot of ways that we can get people to come to church. But I'm committed to doing it the right way. And if I'm labeled as a fanatic or as a fundamentalist for wanting to do it the biblical, scriptural way, then I'm going to get labeled that way. If that means that we're not going to get a lot of people at a lot of time, then that's okay. But I'm going to do it the right way instead of the easy way. Right? And, and that's kind of my whole thing. Is we have to do it the, the scriptural way. And how do we do that? We speak about righteousness. God is righteous. We are not. But through his death and resurrection, we can become righteous. Right? We can put on his robes of righteousness. We speak of self-control. That through the power of the Holy Spirit, he can help us overcome our trials or our trials and tribulations he can help us overcome our addictions and our and our hardships sometimes it's it's easy sometimes it's not and we speak about the judgment to come that Jesus Christ is coming back are you ready for him when he does and um, that's the gospel in a nutshell and um, so yeah I know it's kind of easy tonight, but <laughs> that's what I got for you. And, um, yeah. So. Anyway. But we'll close with that. And, um, so. And I was going to finish up Ecclesiastes. But Ecclesiastes, and I'll make a comment on this, and, and we'll call it a finish of the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes comes from a heart of um, one who is searching for God. And those Proverbs that are in Ecclesiastes, especially in 10, 11, and 12, come from a person who is searching for God. Okay, So those things that are written there come from a guy who is depressed, comes from a guy who is not saved and so these things that he says in there uh, come from there and I'm not going to go through those as I was reading through them not that I don't um, like it but it gets depressing um, and so we're going to move to the Psalms um, I've been kind of having my heart in the Psalms and we're going to pick up in Psalm 75 and we're going to work our way through the second half of of Psalms. The reason why I'm starting in Psalm 75 is because Autumn says that I've beaten the first half to death and uh, it's easy to start something and then 
as time goes on, you get tired and quit. So I'm going to start in the middle, and we're, we're going to go work our way to the end. And so uh, we're going to start at Psalm 75, and we're going to take a psalm a week, and we're going to just bask in the presence of, of music and uh, songs of worship. And um, so I think that'll be really cool. So. Yeah, so, but there's still a lot of good psalms in, in the second half, too, so we'll, uh, we'll get there, so, all right, so hopefully we'll see everybody next week, so until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved.